Hello, and welcome to another video. A video about this, the Compact Portable 3. Released in 1987 for around $5,000, and adjusting for inflation, that's, uh, well, I'll put how much it is on the screen, but I'm gonna guess that was a lot of money back then. Um, this machine is a Twitty 6 system running at, I think it's a uh, 12 megahertz, and uh, it's a portable as in, Got a handle and carry it around. There's no battery or anything. It's not a laptop. It's just you'd bring it somewhere, you'd set it down, you'd uh, unclip your keyboard, and then you'd pop up your screen, and you'd get to work. You could bring this wherever you want, and you have a nice little portable workstation that you know, it only needs to be plugged in. All right, this machine is a little bit special because on the back is a little expansion bay here that can hold ISA cards. This was an extra, I think it's around $200 extra. In this one, I have a network card and a sound card, which we'll talk about later on in the video. Um, the machine also came equipped with a 1.2 meg floppy drive by default and uh, a little upgrade in here, which uh, again, we'll talk about a little later on in the video. You may also notice the keyboard cable is a little wonky. That's not the uh, normal keyboard cable. The person I bought this from had um, tried to fix the keyboard and uh, the cable's a little bit not the right length. No big deal, but you know, just kind of a little not the right length. I might have to try to fix that so it kind of all folds together properly, but you know, whatever. Um, on the back is a serial port, a parallel port, and a uh, nine pin RGB port, not a VGA port. I think it's just a CGA port. And also on the side, you could also see that there under the floppy drive is also a, uh, a modem. A modem which may have been useful then, but not terribly useful now. So let's take this machine and uh, See what we can do with it. All right, so let's get to it. We can see that the keyboard cable is kind of sticking out here because whoever had this before me replaced the keyboard cable and well, they started to coil it, but I don't know if they coiled it enough or if it's the right length to fit in the case. So I just kind of leave it dangling out for now. I can fix this later. So let's open this up. And the keyboard just comes off like that. Normally the cable would be sitting in here when it's folded up, but it doesn't quite fold up right with the way this cable is. So I, that's why I just kind of leave it out of the case when it's, when it's folded. Unfortunately, the keyboard is missing the little feet on the back of it, but not really a big deal. So before we do anything, we can get this powered up and see what it does. Hit these buttons here to raise the screen up a little bit. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to record the screen here because this uses a nine pin video out, which I don't have an adapter for at the moment. I will try to get one, but it just means for right now, I can't connect this to the capture machine to record it. So I'm going to have to just record the screen. So let's go ahead and plug it in and turn it on and see what it does. I'm doing my best to stand out of the reflection of the screen. So you hopefully you can see it and we're going to power this on. Okay, we can see that it turns on just fine. And there we go. It's doing the RAM test, counting up 640K RAM. And keyboard or system unit error. And it's booting up the SCSI BIOS on the SCSI card that's in the ISA expansion bag. There is no SCSI disks found, obviously and it wants the diagnostic disk, which I will download once we get everything working. And, well, I can't hit F1 or anything. Numlock and scroll lock on the keyboard aren't working. So something's definitely wrong with the keyboard. I don't know if I need to take the keyboard apart, but first I think we're gonna open this up and see if I can just like plug a normal keyboard into it 
and see if we can go from there. So before we start completely dis disassembling this, we need to take off the ISA expansion bracket. And so first we open that up just to take out any of the cards. I guess we don't need to do that, but let's just take the cards out anyway. See what's in here. There's no screw on this, and if we pull it out, maybe. Come on. We have a SCSI controller. I wonder why it was in here. Obviously, the internal SCSI port is not going to be very useful, but I guess the must have been used with the external one. It's. Uh, I don't know if you really see that camera here, but it's a little dirty in there. And interestingly, all that's in here is just two, two ISA slots and a lot of dirt. So we're going to clean that out once I figure out how to actually take this whole thing off. This whole piece should come off of the back. I think there's some clips along the top here, so I'll, I can get this off and we can open this up and try to disconnect the keyboard and see if we can fix it. So I wasn't sure how to get this off, and it turns out this little bar here, you just pull it out, and then just pops right off. Connects using this connector. I don't, know if, I don't know if this is the same as the connector on the Compaq SLT-286. It'd be cool if it was. I don't think it is, but it'd be cool. So, with this taken away, I can clean it, and also now I can just open this guy up. Another fun thing, with the expansion off, there's a cute little door that just slides over and covers the expansion slot for when you don't need it. So in case anyone's wondering, I have no idea how to take this apart. We're just gonna take the screwdriver, start taking out screws, and just kind of see what happens. Well, here we go. The Torx 15, and... Take this screw out. Oh, it's a long screw and it had a little washer on it. Don't want to lose that. This middle screw. Not as long. Gotta get the washer out of here, don't want to lose it. Another giant screw with a washer. Now onto the other side. Let's bring on the top here. I'm just gonna spin this towards me. This is a little heavy. Not that bad to move around. Start the middle one here, I guess. And I'm assuming these edge ones are also super long and have washers. All right, it's much easier to put back together if all the screws are the same, or at least the four corner screws are the same, and I think the two middle ones are the same. So I don't know, I don't know what to do next after getting all these screws out. I guess we'll just see if this panel wants to come off, or, oh, well, I guess it does. Just want to come off. So this is super cool. On the inside here is a little guide to all of the jumpers that are on the motherboard. Some more information about the motherboard jumpers. So I guess they don't really mind you opening this thing up, take a look inside if there are instructions on the inside of the case and how to do stuff. Inside, we can see our motherboard here. Let's see if I can get it in frame. It's better. I'm gonna guess this is our CPU here and this empty socket here is for a 287, which I do have and I am going to install. I don't think it really needs one, but I think it'd be fun to put one in anyway. So I guess next we can unscrew this 
shield here because we got to get to the other side where the keyboard cable is to see if we can disconnect it. All right, let's get to unscrewing this shield. That is the wrong screw bit. I just switched from Torx 15 to Torx 10. Put this little screw out. Interesting, these seem similar to the screws that were in the Compaq SLT laptop. Wouldn't be surprised. Both Compaq products. So the machine was powered on. It's powered off now, un unplugged, but it was powered on. So I hopefully won't touch the power supply or anything. <laughs> I'm going to try to avoid that. I don't know. Hopefully it's discharged, you know, since it's been off, but it has been off for that long. More screws are here. There's two more screws. And so we can get this shield off. And then also so we can start unplugging cables and stuff. Is there something else holding this shield on? Oh, yep, there's one more screw. Okay, so this is interesting. I pulled this off and you can see it's got some connectors on it. One connects to the motherboard and the other connects to this card here, which I think might be, I don't know. Oh, it seems to be a um, the modem. This has a modem in it. Modem might be terribly useful without a phone line, but that's neat that it has one. And then now I think I can get, finally get this shield off. Yep. Shield off. Oh, and I guess I would have read this does say modem adapter on it. So, you know, reading is good. All right, so what do I do now? I guess I should try to get this whole motherboard off, which means connecting, disconnecting all these cables. Also, I guess here we see our, our RAM there. Let's take out this big, scary looking power cable here. If I unscrew the board first and then I'll take the cables off. Let's do that. Any more screws on the board or maybe not. This board just, oh, nope. Oh. This is screwed on here on the bottom. I guess it's for grounding purposes. So if we get that screw off. Okay, so the motherboard can kind of pull up now. Obviously all the cables are still attached to it. So disconnecting the cables now is probably our best bet. So let's see if I can't get these off now. There's this one, maybe for the floppy drive. Floppy drive is right here, so maybe that's the cable for it. This one, hard drive cable, I imagine. I don't know what these are. Maybe I should label them first before I pull them off. So hopefully I remember which one goes where. Or how do you even get these off? Okay, they just pull off. Yeah, hold on, let me just label these to be safe. Okay, so we got some of the cables off. There's still this one, and there's actually another cable which is under this, and there's three screws here, and you can see this cable. So I need to take these off so I can get to this cable. And hey, look, nice, there's a, oh, you can see it, there's a little, little bodge wire here. It's fun. Don't worry, I will show the motherboard closer to the camera once we get it all out of the out of the case here. Motherboard is fully disconnected. That little cable I was talking about is actually the the plug where the video connector goes. So here's our motherboard. I'm going to assume this is the CPU. This is where our 287 goes. 
we got here. Okay, we'll focus our bio chips. We actually have four ROM sockets, but only two of them are filled. Um, what else we got? Here's some RAM. On the back, here's that bodge wire I was talking about. Oh, and all type, besides from some dirt, motherboard looks pretty good. I mean, as we can see, the machine powers up, so that's a good sign. Luckily, I don't have to replace any of these caps or anything. All I'm going to do to this motherboard is throw a 287 in there, and then we'll put it back together. But I'll do that later. We have to go further into the system. Also, I dropped a screw in the system, so I need to go find that before we do anything else. In my disassembly, I pulled this card out of here, which is the modem. And then I pulled out this card, which seems to be the video card, because it's got the RGB connector on it. And then this goes to the motherboard, presumably to connect somehow to the screen. All right, trying to go further in disassembly, I popped off this little plate here. Presumably you could have two floppy drives. Obviously one of them is covered up here, so let's take that away. And now we can see we have our floppy drive here. These cables were what connected to the board. And I don't know if I can just pull the flop. Oh, I can, I can just pull this whole. Okay, so this whole assembly comes out. So we have our floppy drive. And then is there anything else in here? There's a hard drive in here. Let's try to get that hard drive out. Also, there's that screw I dropped. I got the hard drive taken out of that bracket. Looks like those cables I was worried about mixing up were just Molex cables, so clearly it doesn't matter which one goes where. And moving this ID cable out of the way, we get our Seagate. Hard drive here seems to be 214 megabytes. I don't know if this works, and I was planning on replacing this with a compact flash card anyway, so I will test this, see if anything's on it, but I probably just wind up replacing it anyway. So I just wanted to try to replace the keyboard or plug a different keyboard into it. I figured I'd take it all apart to get to it, and I don't. This just pulls out. So this is about it as simple that I'm gonna I'm gonna take it. The rest is just take like the power supply out or take the screen out, which is not necessary. So this is about as this assembles as I need to take this machine. So now with the keyboard detached, I can try to take the keyboard apart or see if I have another keyboard that might be compatible and just try to plug that in instead. So a few more things about this motherboard. This chip that I said, oh, that's the CPU. No, that's actually the um, the keyboard controller, which means I don't know if this computer can use a normal like AT or XT keyboard. For here in this spot, there used to be a battery. I wonder if that, uh, presumably the BIOS battery. Obviously it doesn't really need it, but you know, obviously the settings won't be saved without it. So I can try to replace this, but it would need to be soldered onto the board. It might just be easier just to leave it off of there. Um, I'm going to guess this here under this big metal plate is actually the CPU. I don't feel like trying to take this metal plate off, but there you go. So the keyboard controller chip is in a socket. So if I could take it off and replace it with another one, then maybe I can connect an AT or XT keyboard. But so I guess I'm going to look at just the keyboard itself and take that apart and see if there's anything I can do there to fix it. And I guess I'll also just put this back together since the keyboard plugs in and out from the front, so no need to take it apart. So let's put it back together. So I'm putting it back together and I'm left wondering a few things. One, do I keep the hard drive in it or not? Uh, do I want to replace this with a compact flash card or I want to keep the hard drive in it? Two, does this drive work? And three, do I want to keep this drive in there or, or do I want to replace this with just a normal three and a half inch floppy drive instead of a five and a quarter inch floppy drive? Decisions, decisions. Okay, so I've decided to keep in the original 
floppy drive, but replace the hard drive with just a compact flash adapter. It needs this Molex power adapter cable, and hopefully this should work inside the system. Hope I can just mount it, you know, kind of where the hard drive went. I guess I'll just like tape it down to it or something. Could be fine. Um, might be nice maybe to have like the compact flash card sticking out so I can get to it and pull it in and out, but I don't know how I would really do that. So here's the the bracket that goes over and these drive slots are not normal height drive slots, they're actually slim drive slots. This floppy drive seems to be the same height as the one that goes in the Compact Desk Pro as well. It's a very slim line drive so I don't know if I can use like a normal front mounted compact flash adapter with like a five and a quarter adapter. I don't know if that would quite fit and I don't know if I want to, I don't know if we really want to cut out like a slot for the compact flash card here so I'm not sure how I'm going to mount it. For simplicity's sake I might just keep the compact flash card internal and then just deal with it later, open it up if I need to get it. Maybe in the future I'll find a way to have it be external, but for now we'll just mount it inside and hopefully that works. All right, now to put it back together. So I've mounted the comeback flash adapter here. I first taped a piece of plastic to the bottom of it, just nothing short, and then I stuck some mounting squares to it and it doesn't seem to really be going anywhere. It's not the best, I don't know if it's permanent, but it's not going anywhere, so I guess it's good enough. So, kind of fold all the cables like this, like, with the hard drive in the way, the cables were like routed under the hard drive and stuff, but without the hard drive there, it doesn't really matter how these are routed as long as they all plug in, so that doesn't really matter. Maybe let's do there, and this slides back in here. Before we put the motherboard in, let's do one one quick little upgrade. Be this here. This is a 287. So this is pretty easy to install. Just find the notch, which is on this side, and put it into the socket, making sure it's all lined up. Let me just sort of bend the pins a little bit so they're nice and fit in the socket. You're facing the correct direction. Yep, there's a notch on the socket. It matches the notch on the chip. And then we just push it in. Mm, look at our pins. Everything looks good. And here we go. Or 287. Doesn't 100% match the speed of the CPU, but from my research, that doesn't matter. Seems like this should be perfectly fine. I think we have like a 12 megahertz CPU, and this is a 10 megahertz 287. But again, from what I've looked up, that shouldn't matter. So this should be good to go here. Now, time to screw the motherboard back in now that all the connectors are back in. Kind of got to stuff the ID cable back in there since the, the hard drive was kind of holding it in place. Without it, it's kind of blobs around. So let's just sort of tuck that back in there. The faceplate will cover that up and it'll be fine. So let's get our screws, put them back in. All right, I'm on the board in place. Let's screw our crazy little shield thing back on now. All right, how to connect this thing because the modem's got a little connector on it and that's got to connect to the board here. Also, it looks like you can put like two different cards in here because there's two connectors on here. So you could, something else that could be slotted back here. Not sure what that would be. So let's get this thing back on now. Should hopefully just, yeah, should just clip on. All right, I guess let's put the panel back on here and get it all sealed up. 
All right, and with that, it's time to put the back panel back on. And then we just screw that back in. They're nice, big, long screws here. All right, now that it's all back together, we can't forget the ISO expansion. So let's open up our little expansion door here and slot this guy back on. Make sure this bar is pulled out. Line it up. Make sure that it's actually attached and, and clip it on in. So now for ISA cards, we're gonna install some fun stuff. First off, we have a sound card here. This is an ESS audio drive. Interestingly, this is a non-plug and play card. It's got all the jumpers here to configure it. I'm not, I forget what this is actually configured to, but I think I wrote it down somewhere. So I'm gonna throw it in there now and we'll figure out what it's set to later. So we put this in this expansion slot. I'll get a screw for that in a sec. Next we have this 3Com card here, Ethernet card, which kind of has something fun added to it. We have this EEPROM chip here, which has the XTE IDE Universal BIOS image on it. This is probably going to be needed because I don't know if this computer will be able to detect that compact flash card without it. So you line up the notch, the notch, and we drop our ROM chip into our network card. And as long as this is configured correctly, it should be able to run this option ROM, just like it did with the option ROM on the SCSI card we took out. All right, so now let's slot in our ethernet card. There we go. Do ISA cards in there and on the side, put up the door and you get your ethernet port and your sound ports. Except for the keyboard that doesn't seem to want to work anyway. It's all back together, so here we go. Let's see what happens. I don't think anything's going to happen with the 287. It might know that it's there, but it won't do anything unless I run a program for it. The one thing I want to see is if the boot ROM works on the network card. Yes, I know, keyboard error. I heard the floppy making noise. And we're not getting anything from the boot ROM. That's not the worst. I might need to just run the a configuration program on the network card in order to tell it to run the boot ROM or you know put it in the right spot in memory so we still have some work to do on it but at least I didn't break it. Another day another time to work on the compact portable and here we have the drive cage in the inside and as you may notice there's a nice little 3d printed bracket in here. Well there's someone on eBay who makes 3d printed brackets for compact flash holders and commissioned him to make one that fits in here. It matches the size of the floppy drive, though there are a few little issues. The floppy drive is held on with these little kind of squishy washers here, and I obviously don't have any of those, so while the 3 printed adapter is the same size as the floppy drive, I don't know if you can see, but like the floppy drive is actually like floating in the center of this hard of this drive cage and is not completely flush to the sides so i kind of had to do the same thing with the 3d printed adapter by just taping some washers to the outside of it and then getting some slightly longer screws not using the normal screws to hold it on but it seems to be installed on there and when you get the plate that goes over the drives there we go we have the floppy drive and we have accessible the comeback flash card. So it's time to get this put back into the system. So let's bundle our cables up. And slide our drive tray in. So now we can just, in the extra space in the IDE adapt, in the comeback flash mount, you just, that's where we can tuck our cable mess, doesn't matter. 
as long as it's not blocking the compact flash port, which you easily get to. Yep, that's all good. Let's get this slid back in. Okay, so what can we do now? Apparently we need to fix the keyboard, but luckily we can just unplug the keyboard. This is actually an AT keyboard. I did some research and the chip in there is, the keyboard controller in there can support AT and even XT keyboards. So as long as you have the right connector, any AT keyboard will fit in there. So luckily this keyboard has a connector that does just slide on into this hole and plug in. So now, let's power it on. And here we saw some lights on the keyboard where we didn't on the other keyboard. So now let's see what happens. So now we get an error saying enter the diagnostic disk in the drive. And you know, also that the time and date isn't set because there's no BIOS battery, but notice what's missing, no keyboard error. So we hit F1 on the keyboard. We hear it try to load the floppy disk. So the keyboard is broken. The actual computer itself does work. So now let's get a floppy disk. So now's where we hope the floppy drive in this machine actually works. Here I have a copy of the diagnostic disk. So the image for this is a 360K image, but this, and this is a 360K disk, but I wrote this in a 1.2 meg drive. And when you do that, sometimes you have issues, but since the drive in this is also 1.2 meg, I think it's able to read it. So let's put it in the floppy drive and try to boot from it. No idea if this is gonna work. Hmm, either that means I put the disk in upside down, it means the floppy drive doesn't work, or it means I need to rewrite a floppy disk. Once, so let's just try again. I hear it trying to load the disk. Doing something. Oh, oh, it worked. So on the floppy drive, you put the disk in and then you push in the little eject button, then it stays in. Apparently that made it actually work. Okay, this is good. Also, I don't know how long this will take to load. So right now I don't have the expansion chassis installed. Also, what the hell was that? Apparently it just, uh, it got to the boot and then it just shut off. That's, it just rebooted. That's, that's not good. I'm saying I don't have the expansion chassis installed with the ISA cards. I just want to make sure the machine boots before I do anything and uh, uh, I'll just try it again. I also have some MS-DOS disks. If the diagnostic disk is the one I run, I can just try to boot into just a normal MS-DOS prompt. Maybe the diagnostic disk doesn't like the um, compact flash adapter. Maybe it doesn't like not having a BIOS battery. Maybe it wants the ISA expansion installed. I don't know. The diagnostic disc won't be super useful. I mean, it's the BIOS setup, but without a BIOS battery, it's not gonna do a whole lot. So uh, I'll show you what my idea will be since this isn't working. I'll show you what I'm gonna try to do otherwise. Let's power this off. So I reconnected the ISA cards and now inside is just a normal MS-DOS disk and not the diagnostic disk. So my hope is that I can run the drivers for the, or at least the setup program for the network card and get the boot ROM on the network card to work, which will let me hopefully see and then boot off of the compact flash card. And what is it, why is it telling me this is not good? This should be an MS-DOS disk. Unless I put the wrong disk in. Oh, yep. Silly me. 
This is the operating disk. I need the startup disk. Is it going to boot now? I rebooted. That's weird. Is it booting? Is it going to reboot? I hear drawing the boot. Oh, oh. We got into into DOS. We have this is the DOS startup disk, and now we have DOS running. So the computer works. The floppy drive works. This is this is good. I don't know why the diagnostic just doesn't work, but who cares? This is what I wanted. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to set up the Ethernet card, so hopefully it can run the boot ROM, which means that I can actually install DOS under the compact flash card. Okay, so installed in the ISA expansion slot is a 3COM Ethernet 3 card, which this can see. So now I want to configure the NIC. So what I did was I just downloaded the 3COM drivers and put them onto a normal 1.2 meg disk. So see here, you don't really care about the interrupt and stuff for the card, what we care about is that boot PROM there. We want that. So how do we move here? Tab, yeah, modify. And we don't want, okay, I'm gonna leave that the way it is. I wanna modify boot PROM. How do I move up and down? So there just seems to be something weird about the keyboard. I need to turn numlock off and then use like page up and page down on the numpad. But I eventually got to the boot PROM option and it should be a 32K ROM. And it doesn't matter where, I think C800 is normally where you would put it, though it doesn't really matter. So let's hopefully save this. Yeah, that is what we want. We want to save this to the card. Yeah, I owe base address. This has an auto configure. Maybe it can grab the correct IO base address and interrupt. All I care about really. Okay, so this looks good. This is what I want. Might be conflicting with the sound card, which is a non plug and play sound card and just has jumpers on it, but. Mostly I just care about the boot ROM. So let's, let's save this anyway, and we can fix it later if something weird happens. This is what I want. Good. Now let's exit. I'm going to take this disk out because it's not bootable. This is just the drivers. I'm not going to put the compact flash card in just yet. I'm just going to reboot and see if the boot ROM works. If it does, then I'll shut it off, put in the compact flash card. Nothing on the card, but as long as we can see it, we can format it and install it. Let's just see if the boot ROM works. All right. XT IDE BIOS. <laughs> this is what I wanted. This is on the EEPROM on the network card. It's okay. This is fine. All I need to do now is shut off, put in the compact flash card, and see if it sees it. And then we'll have to boot up a floppy disk and format it and blah blah blah. But this is good. There's now a compact flash card in there. And when I hit F1, maybe it can detect it. I hope it can. Yeah. If not, we're in trouble. Oh, oh, master cactus flash card. So it can see the compact flash card. There's nothing on it. So it's, I might try to boot off of it and fail because there's nothing on it. And okay, yeah. So I tried to boot up the floppy, failed. 
try to boot off of the comeback flash card, also failed. This is fine. The BIOS works, the comeback flash card works. All you have to do now is format the comeback flash card. I did a lot of this off camera because it was kind of boring, but I got the diagnostic disc to boot and I set the options. So now that error goes away, I threw in a compact flash card, ran F disc, and then format slash S. And so now, if everything goes well, you see it detects our compact flash card. A different one than I was using before, but whatever. And hopefully, it boots into DOS. This takes a second. And if all goes well, there's no floppy disk. Ah, damn it. So this, this bootloader here, not really an issue. This is what's on the compact flash card. And I can't fix it. I need to like reformat this compact flash card outside. So I guess I'll have to use another compact flash card and start all over. I threw another compact flash card in. F disk, format, reboot. Let's see if I can't boot into DOS off of a compact flash card. So far, so good. See the compact flash card. This takes a sec. It's probably gonna try to boot off a of floppy and then obviously fail because I took the floppy disk out. And then, yes, it booted off the compact flash card. So now, we ha now that we technically have a DOS system, let's run something for DOS. Though I think this doesn't work perfectly well with DOS 3. I know there's an issue when you quit Planet X 3. If you're running DOS 3, it just gets all garbled. So we just won't quit. We will just turn the machine off, I guess. Throw in our disk. Go to drive A. Planet X3. Um, I don't know what this can do for color. This is basically just like monochrome. I don't know if this is going to do anything. Well, that's a good sign. It works. Though, as you know, I did put a sound card in there. And it is a non-plug and play sound card, which means well, if the jumpers are set up properly, all I have to do is try to talk to the sound card and it should work. So, let's power this off. And let's try to run it with the sound card. So I left Planet X3 in the drive and rebooted and you can see it's got a funny message. You actually can try to boot from the Planet X3 disk and it tells you that uh, it's not a boot disk. You must boot from DOS first. That's kind of funny. So let's try PX3 again. Run it in the CGA four color mode. Let's try and try AdLib. This should just be able to talk to the sound card, maybe. So, the sound card works. Out of curiosity, I want to try to boot up the diagnostic disc now that the compact flash card and stuff works, just to see if it identifies that it has a hard drive. You know, just to see what the diagnostic disc says about the system, what it says about the compact flash card. I'm gonna, we have that disc in there, and Eventually, it will decide to boot off the floppy disk. This, this takes a while. There it goes. Booting A. I'm just so happy this machine actually works. I do need to take apart the keyboard and probably just resolder the cable, but the rest of the machine works. There we go. We want to inspect, because we actually already ran setup, I just did it off camera. So let's run inspect and see if it 
can identify what it identifies. I don't know if it'll, I don't know if you need to run setup for it to be, be the drive or not. Let's find out. Sorry if I keep moving in front of the light. Also, sorry if I'm, you know, filming the screen. I don't have the proper adapter. I ordered a CGA to VGA adapter, but I don't have it yet. So we're going to have to work on it this way. Eventually we'll get that, I hope. So here we have Comeback Portable 3. We have our 12 megahertz 286. Even detects our 287. That's good. Our system ROM is from 1987. Option ROMs. The first option ROM, I'm pretty sure, is the... XTIDE, unless it's taking up both option ROM slots, I'm not sure. We have our video mode as 80 columns or 1.2 meg drive. We only have 640k of RAM, that's fine. What else we got? So this is different than what the setup program told me. That was talking about fixed disk and stuff. Though I guess XID takes over, so this isn't gonna show it anyway. But hey, at least this system does work. It makes me real happy that it does. All right, and I think that'll finish up this episode on this computer. Still a bit of work to be done. Still need to try to repair the built-in keyboard. Have to replace the wire. Um, still need to get a battery for it because every time I unplug it, it forgets all its diagnostic settings and that kind of screws up XTIDE. It works perfectly fine when the settings are saved, but when they're not saved, I need to boot without the compact flash card, run the diagnostic floppy, save the settings, turn the machine off, put the compact flash card back in, and then it works fine. So I need another battery. And one more upgrade is, well, an actual upgrade. In the next episode, we're going to see if we can get DOS 5 installed over top the version of DOS 3 that's already on it. So thanks for watching this episode and stay tuned for the next one.